Hey there, and welcome back for another deep dive. It's great to be back. Today, we're going to be wading into some pretty murky waters. Oh. The Middle East. Definitely murky. We're going to be looking at how a recent event could have some serious ripple effects. Right. And we've got some fascinating excerpts from a source okay. called TLL that offer a really unique take on things. All right. Are you ready to jump in? Absolutely. Okay. So our source is diving right into the deep end. Okay. Claiming that Iran was behind that recent drone strike aimed at Netanyahu's residence. Hmm. And get this. Yeah. They're saying it was orchestrated by Khamenei himself. Wow. Aiming to take out Israel's leadership. It's a bold claim, that's for sure. It is. Um, and it's important to remember that this source seems to be advocating a specific viewpoint. Okay. And they're drawing a direct parallel to the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Yes. Back in 2020. Right. They're suggesting that Iran was emboldened by that event. Okay. And now they're taking even more aggressive action. Wow, that's a lot to unpack. Yeah. So they're basically saying Iran is trying to behead the Israeli leadership. Just like the U.S. did with Soleimani. Essentially, yes. And there's even a suggestion that China is somehow pulling the strings behind the scenes. Right. Pushing Iran to be more aggressive. That's their claim. Okay. This is where I need your expert insight. Sure. Even though the drone strike didn't actually hit Netanyahu. Yeah. Why is this such a big deal? Well, what? What does it mean for the region? You've hit on a critical point. Okay. This isn't just about one drone. Right. It's about the message it sends and the potential for escalation. Okay. This source seems to be suggesting that this attack, regardless of its success, right. represents a significant escalation of tensions between Iran and Israel. So they're saying this is like crossing a red line. Yeah. That things are about to get much hotter between these two countries. That's certainly the implication. Okay. And the source then takes it a step further claiming that this attack gives Israel the legal justification to retaliate directly against Iran. Really? And specifically against Khamenei. They even argue that Israel, because it's a democracy with a strong legal framework, right. has a standing that authoritarian regimes lack. Wait a minute, hold on. Yeah. Are they saying there's a difference in how a democracy can respond to something like this? Yes. Versus a country like Iran? That seems to be their argument. That's why. It's an interesting perspective. Tell me more about this legal distinction they're making. So this is where the source really dives into the leads of international law and political systems. Okay. They argue that because Israel operates within a democratic system with transparent legal processes, okay. they can justify their actions on a global stage okay. in a way that a country like Iran under Khamenei's leadership might not be able to. Interesting. They're suggesting that Israel's actions would be seen as a legitimate response to an act of aggression. While Iran's actions are inherently suspect because they don't operate within the same kind of system. So it's not just about might makes, right? Right. It's about who has the better legal argument. That's their point. That's fascinating. Yeah. But does this mean that every time a country is attacked, they can just claim self-defense and retaliate? Well, it can't be that simple, right? Of course not. Okay. And that's why the source emphasizes the importance of what they call lawfare. Okay. Basically using legal systems and international pressure as tools of engagement and influence. Interesting. They see it as a long game. Okay. A way to achieve strategic objectives without resorting to outright warfare. Lawfare, huh? Yeah. That's a new one for me. It's a term that's being used more and more. It sounds like something you'd hear on John Grisham podcast, not necessarily one about international relations. Right. So how does this lawfare thing actually work in the real world? Well, think of it this way. Okay. Instead of just launching missiles, you're building a legal case. The gathering evidence uh, and using international courts, uh, sanctions, uh, uh, and both. trade agreements to pressure your opponents. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it's like playing chess instead of checkers, right? Exactly. You're thinking several moves ahead using strategy and leverage instead of just brute force. Right. But our source also had some strong opinions about China, right? Y yes, they did. They didn't hold back on how China plays the game. No, they did not. Okay, I'm hooked. You're good. Tell me more about what they see as China's big misunderstanding. They seem to think China believes it's all about forcing their own rules on everyone else. Kind of like a my way or the highway approach to global politics. Exactly. But the source argues that true international order isn't about coercion. It's about creating a system so advantageous that other countries want to participate. 
Okay, that's a really interesting distinction. Yeah. So it's not about forcing your will on others. It's about creating a system that everyone sees as beneficial, even if they have to play by your rules. Precisely. And they draw a fascinating parallel between this idea of international law and a complex software system. Okay. They even use this wild image of a sports stadium filled with legal texts to illustrate just how massive and intricate the system is. Wow. Particularly when it comes to the U.S. legal framework. A whole stadium full of legal jargon. Right. That's a terrifying thought. It's a lot. But I get their point. It's a huge and complex system. But how does that make the U.S. any different from China? Okay, sure. Don't they both have their own sets of rules and regulations? That's where things get really interesting. The source contends that the U.S. system, with all its flaws and complexities, is constantly evolving and being refined through debate and challenge. Okay. They argue that it's this very process of adaptation and improvement that sets it apart. So it's like the American operating system, as they call it. Yeah. Is open source always being tweaked and updated based on new information and challenges. That's a great analogy. And they seem to be suggesting that this ability to adapt and evolve is what ultimately makes the U.S. system more resilient and influential in the long run. They argue that China, on the other hand, is too rigid, okay, too focused on control, and that this lack of flexibility will ultimately be their downfall on the world stage. It makes you wonder what would happen if we apply this operating system analogy to other areas of life, like what are the rules of the game in business or even in our personal relationships? That's a thought-provoking question. Mm -hmm. And the source actually touches on this idea through a rather unexpected example. They talk about this company that tried to build a casino in Missouri. Wait, what? Yeah. Casinos in international law. It's a good one. How does that even fit in? Bear with me. It's actually a brilliant illustration of their point. This company, Fluss with Cash, waltzed into Missouri, assuming they could just throw money around and build their casino wherever they pleased. But they completely underestimated the existing power structures, the entrenched interests, and the complexities of the legal system. So they thought they could just buy their way in without understanding the rules of the game. Exactly. And it blew up in their face. The source uses this story to highlight a key difference between how, in their view, the U.S. and China approach these kinds of situations. They're suggesting that Chinese companies used to operating in a system where connections and influence reign supreme often stumble when they encounter a system based on the rule of law where those tactics don't work as effectively. It's a classic case of when in Rome. Right. You can't just impose your own way of doing things. You have to learn the local customs, the unspoken rules, the way things really work. Yeah. It's fascinating how this source connects these seemingly disparate ideas international relations, legal theory, business strategy, back to the central concept of understanding the rules of the game. Absolutely. And it's a powerful takeaway for all of us, whether we're talking about navigating geopolitical tensions, building a business, or even just trying to understand the world around us. So if we bring it back to the situation with Iran and Israel, are they suggesting that Israel should be playing the lawfare game instead of engaging in direct retaliation? Well, it's not about choosing one or the other. It's about recognizing that there are multiple ways to achieve your objectives. Yeah. The source seems to be advocating for a more nuanced approach, one that leverages Israel's strengths, okay. its democratic institutions, its legal framework, its alliances with other nations who share those values to counter Iran's aggression. So it's about playing the long game, Yeah. not just seeking immediate retribution, but working within the existing systems of power to achieve a more lasting solution. Precisely, and that requires a deep understanding of the rules of the game, a willingness to adapt your strategy as needed, and the patience to see those strategies through to their conclusion. It's fascinating how this source manages to connect something as complex as the situation in the Middle East to something as relatable as trying to build a casino in Missouri. It really highlights that no matter what the scale, whether it's global politics or our own personal lives, understanding the rules of the game is essential for achieving our goals. I couldn't agree more. It's all about strategy influence and knowing how to navigate complex systems to get what you want. But it's also about recognizing that those rules are constantly evolving and the most successful players are the ones who can adapt and evolve along with them. Just like they say, the only constant is change, right? But before we get too philosophical, I'm curious to hear more about what this all means for the future of the U.S. and China on the global stage. They seem to be setting up a pretty stark contrast between these two systems, these two ways of approaching the world. It's almost like they're saying these two countries are playing two different games entirely. And they're both convinced they're playing by the right rules. Exactly. It's like you said earlier about might makes right versus this whole lawfare concept. 
The source seems to be suggesting that the U.S., for all its flaws, has a built-in advantage because its system is designed to adapt and evolve. It's messy, it's chaotic, but it's ultimately responsive to change. China, on the other hand, they argue, is too invested in maintaining control and sticking to a rigid set of rules that might not be equipped for a world that's constantly shifting. So it's not just about who has the most power right now, it's about who's better equipped to handle the challenges of the future. That's a great way to put it. And it actually reminds me of that classic saying, uh, what is it? it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who will survive, but those who can best manage change. This source seems to be saying that the U.S., with its operating system of constant adaptation, might just have the upper hand in the long run. That's a powerful thought, especially given all the uncertainty in the world right now. But it also makes you wonder, where does that leave everyone else? I mean, if these two global superpowers are locked in this battle of ideologies, this clash of systems, where does that leave the rest of us? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? And while this source mainly focuses on geopolitics, I think there's a powerful message here for all of us, no matter what our role is in the world. So how do we as individuals navigate this complex and ever-changing landscape? Mm -hmm. Should we all be brushing up on our international law and studying the U.S. legal system? Well, it's not about becoming legal experts or anything like that. It's more about cultivating a mindset of adaptability, a willingness to learn and evolve as the world around us changes. This source is essentially saying that the most important skill in the 21st century is the ability to not just understand the rules, but to master them, to use them to your advantage and to adapt them when necessary. So it's about being agile, being resourceful, being a quick study. Exactly. It's about being able to see the bigger picture, to anticipate challenges and to find creative solutions within whatever framework you're dealing with. Yeah. It's about recognizing that the rules of the game might be different in every situation and being willing to adjust your approach accordingly. It's like that old saying, when in Rome. Do as the Romans do, exactly. But it's not just about blending in, it's about understanding why the Romans do what they do, what makes their system work, and how you can use that knowledge to your advantage. Wow, talk about a crash course in global strategy and personal development. This deep dive has really given me a lot to think about. So as we wrap things up, is there one key takeaway you hope our listeners will walk away with? I think the most important message here is that power isn't just about brute force anymore. It's about understanding and mastering the systems that govern our world, whether those systems are political, economic, social, or even personal. It's about being a player, not just a pawn in the game. Exactly. And the best players, the ones who truly thrive, are those who understand that the rules of the game are constantly changing and are ready to adapt and evolve along with them. Beautifully said. It's a powerful message for us all as we navigate the complexities of the 21st century. And on that note, we'll leave you to ponder the rules of the game in your own world. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep.